I, I hate to use, you know, I hate to declare anything, but right now, all of the evidence we seem to have points to this idea that this was a myth. Hello and welcome to Sparta Reexamined Episode 4. My name is Adam, I'm an ancient Greek reenactor and history enthusiast, and today I'm joined by some familiar faces, uh, Benny Trusker and Patrick Mulher. Now today we're going to be covering the uh, very interesting topic of Spartans discarding their children on Mount Targetos uh, for being weak or puny. This is a very um, commonly spread uh, piece of information that they would have discarded weak children. Was this true? Is this a myth? Is there any blurry lines in between? And what did the rest of the Greeks do that was the same or different to the Spartans? So Patrick, where do we sort of get this myth or information from regarding uh, the Spartans discarding of, of babies. The main source, and by main, I could also say only, uh, there is a line in Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus, where he says, Offspring was not reared at the will of the father, but was taken and carried by him to a place called Lesha, where the elders of the tribes officially examine the infant, and if it was well-built and sturdy, they ordered the father to rear it and assigned it to one of the 9,000 lots of land. But if it was ill-born and deformed, they sent it to the so-called Apothetus, a chasm-like place at the foot of Mount Tigatus. That line comes from Plutarch. Plutarch, as we covered a couple episodes ago, lived 500 years after classical Sparta. Plutarch does not cite his source for this line, so he doesn't tell us that someone from contemporary time mentioned it. He is our only source. This line basically got completely accepted later on, particularly at the turn of the 20th century. In the late 1800s, a guy you may have heard of named Charles Darwin came up with an idea called evolution. And not long after he came up with that idea, other people wanted to take that to its logical conclusion, or just a logical extreme, where, you know, if we evolve over time, if species, it's just a thing species do, can't we intentionally try to accelerate it in humans? After all, we've been doing this with livestock for thousands of years. I mean, we talked specifically in the second episode about how a lot of people at this point in time just tended to take Plutarch at his word. He was the gold standard. He was the best ancient historian for this time period. And at the same time, you get the confirmation bias from people who are looking at these new scientific ideas who look back and say, wow, apparently this was the key to Spartan success. The Spartans were breeding Ubermensch thousands of years ago. That's why they were so successful. And so this made its way into books, it made its way into histories. It basically just became accepted and taken for granted that this was a practice that the Spartans did. And only really in the last decade or two has there been a lot of work at critically examining that and finding out, was this singular line of Plutarch actually accurate? So, Benny, we just sort of got the literary sources, but as an archaeologist, do we have any uh, archaeological records or evidence to support uh, the discarding of babies at the base of Mount Tigetos? So that's the thing. There is no physical evidence at the base of Mount Tigetos. So Mount Tigetos is to the west of Sparta. I've been to the place. I haven't been to the actual base of the um, <clears throat> mountain, but it's it's actually very beautiful to look at especially when the sun's going down uh, across it's gorgeous but i digress so the thing is is that there have been excavations because of this line of, from plutarch there have been uh professional excavations pseudo professional even treasure hunters or somebody who's just trying to find you know their 15 minutes of fame people have gone all over the base and up around mount taigetta so you can even hike up it if you wanted to to try and find any sort of archaeological evidence that says that child exposure, such as tossing a child off um, the mountain, was a thing. There's nothing. We don't see anything. Now, with that being said, archaeologically speaking, whenever we... Skeletons, right? So, the skeleton of an adult, a fully formed adult, has a much higher chance because it's of uh, remaining throughout the millennia. 
An infant, however, the, you know, the bone is so soft that after just a few generations of decaying or just, uh, being just, you know, decomposition, they'll actually turn into a powder or a dust, and so it's virtually gone. So whenever we look at sift graves or shaft graves and we find for uh, infants, a lot of times we might find a very fine white residue powder if we're lucky enough to find that itself. So theoretically, whenever we look at these, um, you know, the Mount Hygetus child eating type thing, um, I was waiting for somebody to laugh at that child eating. Okay, I digress. You can cut that out later. <laughs> whenever we look at the child being tossed off the uh, mountain and, you know, the remains potentially being around, it's just not there because A, never happened, or B, the uh, remains just evapor not evaporated, but they decompose to the point where there's nothing left. And the C, there are, you know, there is wildlife. There are uh, wolves, etc. All sorts of animals, you know, especially back then, that could have scavenged the child's remains and eaten to the point that there's nothing left. But archaeologically, from what we see, the chances of a child exposure by being taken up to the mountain and then tossed off, very improbable, I would say. And I did have a source. I was actually looking at a study by a guy named Theodoros Pitsios, where they basically did a big dig at the foot of Tigatus. They found the remains of 46 people dated to approximately the 5th or 6th century. And of those 46 bodies, it was all male and all aged between approximately 18 to 35, 36. We've had, we have adult bones, we have no infant bones. This has led to some speculation. I mean, some people have looked at that 46 number and said, hey, that's really similar to the number of bodies that were supposedly buried with a certain Mycenaean named Aristomenes. But there's other people who've looked at this and speculated that, oh, this must have been a place where they executed and buried criminals or traitors. There's a lot of theories about what this could be, but it definitely does not seem to be a place of infants. With that, you know, special, what's interesting is that Sparta was unique within the uh, world of ancient Greece when it comes to their burials. So Sparta actually practiced what's called intramural burials, where they actually buried the bodies within the city, specifically within the home or the area around the home. Whereas most, vast majority of ancient Greek cities did extramural burials, where they would bury the people outside the city walls or the locations of the central of the city. So being buried next to the mountain, especially outside the main city limits, I could definitely see that being somebody who was excommunicated type deal or obviously executed, you know, criminal, stuff like that. Somebody who's not deserving of being buried within the city. It's also a, a social thing where um, it's highly improbable in the sense that Sparta had fairly low be uh, birth rates, or at least among the actual Spartiates, you know, because 9,000 plots of land, that's not a whole lot of people that had the full rise of citizenry. So if you're killing off potential future citizens, you're limiting the amount of uh, people that are there within the city that can protect the territory. So, I, again, I find it highly improbable that they are doing that. I mean, now, if a child is so disfigured that, you know, a leg is an arm and an arm is a tailbone or something like that, I can understand child exposure that way because the child's not going to live no matter what. But if it's something, you know, something similar where like, oh, they have a pectus excavatum, you know, the little div in the chest like I have, I don't see them actually discarding the child in that regard because it doesn't affect me one way, shape, or form. Very hard to picture them discarding potential citizens when they're having such a shortage of citizens. But even beyond this, we actually, that gives us one of the other examples I was going to bring up. We do know of a Spartan king, Agasileus, and Agasileus, we are told, was born with a deformed leg. And he did not get discarded as a kid. He actually grew up and became a king. And you could say, well, you know, if he was, you know, maybe the heir, they made an exception. But the other thing is he was not born heir. He was like a second or third son. I would have to, I should have double checked that before we started. But he was, I'm pretty sure it was a second son. And he ended up becoming king later because 
his older brother died. So then he would have absolutely gone through the Agoge. He was he was brought up in the Agoge, and that is supposedly one of the things that made him a great king because he learned to serve, and being a leader who serves his people generally makes you a better leader than someone who thinks they're in charge to be served. Right, it's interesting. But, so he, he's sort of a Leonidas situation then. Was, uh, Leonidas was the third born, not supposed yeah. to be king, went through the education system. Yeah, exa exact same situation. But he was born with a deformed leg, and he was not cast out, he was not executed. In fact, they said it actually helped prove his worth because of, you know, he worked harder to account for it. So <laughs> the fact that we are specifically told of a Spartan king who was not cast out as a baby. I mean, the opening scene of 300 is them looking at, it opens to a pile of skulls as they examine the prince as a baby and decide if he's gonna be cast out. It really just seems like that's a myth. I, I hate to use, you know, I hate to declare anything, but right now, all of the evidence we seem to have points to this idea that this was a myth and Plutarch's line was not reliable or accurate to classical or archaic Sparta. Right. It's possibly Roman Sparta, at which point Sparta is not even an independent city. It's just a Roman tourist trap. But even then, there's no archaeological evidence that points to it. So. Yeah, so the classical Sparta, the Sparta that most people are referring to in this time period, there's no uh, literary evidence uh, supporting this. There's no archaeological evidence supporting this. And we have examples of Spartans with deformities who were alive in this time period. So it definitely seems that Sparta during the sort of 5th and 4th centuries um, did not discard their children, uh, at least commonly. Um, but Benny, perhaps you know more about this. Do we know of any infants being discarded in the other Greek states? Like what sort of happened uh, in the rest of the Greek world separate from Sparta. Yes, so along in the rest of the Greek world, and honestly, all throughout humanity, child exposure was extremely common. It was basically common up until maybe the 19th or 20th centuries. Uh, and the reason being is because all throughout the history of the world, there are millions, billions of people who just financially cannot raise a child. So what becomes the issue is, you know, you'll have a husband and wife who get married, they're very low income, or they're homeless, right? But of course... Men, men and women have certain needs and feelings and urges, right? So what happens is now the woman is pregnant. Uh-oh, what are we going to do? We cannot afford to raise this child. So once the child is born, the father, mother, whomever, will take the child and they will expose it to the nature and they will take it outside of the city or into the woods, etc. And they will just leave it on the ground or you know leave it on a tree trunk that's been fallen over because it's not because they don't want the child, it's just that they can't financially raise it, and so they leave it for animals to take care of it, to clean it up. We even have a situation in mythology, so it's not a complete one-to-one -one ratio, but in mythology we have a situation of a child exposure with the Greek hero Perseus. You know, his grandfather, Croesus did not want him because he knew, you know, received from the oracle that someday his grandchild would kill him, right? So what does he do? Instead of killing him outright because he... Although that would bring in the wrath of Zeus, he puts his daughter and his grandson in a casket, essentially, and chucks them into the sea. Child exposure. Now, again, it's not a complete one-to-one -one ratio, but even in mythology, we do see instances of child exposure. You know, we even, you know, like um, Moses, you know, in the Old Testament. It's definitely it's a, it's a common trope in myth in old folklore yeah. and legends. Shoot, even Hephaestus. Hephaestus is probably the perfect example. Because his mother, Hera, after he was born and he was deformed, was tossed off Mount Olympus. And yet when he grows up and everything, he comes back as, I'm not going to say the conquering hero, but like, not fully welcomed because of his deformity, but he was still welcomed back as a god. And of course, he made the golden chair for Hera. And I mean, so it's, it's very common to get rid of unwanted children outside of, or well, even with, how can I put this? It's very common to get rid of unwanted children, whether it's for financial reasons or they just didn't want the child. And the nature of the beast is that, you know, a lot of unwanted children all throughout Greece and the history have been exposed. So the, it's kind of hypocritical of Plutarch to say that it's a Spartan practice, especially with the whole ritualized version of it. I mean, if they're going to expose a child, why must they climb up the mountain? Because like I said, you, know, you can hike up, hike up it if you want, but it is still a mountain. I mean, that, that's a long hike and that's a lot of energy 
just to toss a child off off of it when you can just easily go outside the boundary of the city state or sorry of the city leave a child there and then go about your merry way well i think the primary difference with what plutarch's describing is you know in most of these cases it's the parents looking at the child and deciding i can't take care of it or i don't want it whereas in this one it's all children are examined by the city officials and the city officials say this child is worthy or this child is unworthy of life that, that that's the main difference in what's described but it's i mean that would be what sets sparta apart and all evidence seems to point to just that not being the case so yeah i think so sort of to to sum this up a little bit then so we don't have any explicit evidence taken that Spartan statesmen ever examined children to discard them for deformities or anything like that. We don't really have any archaeological evidence to support any discarding of children in Sparta. But it would seem that sort of throughout the whole known world, but in the Greek world as well, certain children would have been discarded for a variety of reasons. But this wouldn't have necessarily been explicitly different in Sparta as opposed to any other state. So once again we sort of come into that situation where maybe Sparta is not as different as people like to make it out to be from the rest of the Greeks. You know, I'm sure Spartan, uh, Spartan children did get exposed occasionally but not examined by an elder of the state to see if they were weak or strong at literally birth. So realistically speaking it likely happened in Sparta. It was not such a ritualistic practice that we like to think of in modern media which sort of gives them a more fierce and warrior culture sort of um, mirage I guess again this is sort of part of the Spartan mirage that we covered in the last video so it probably happened but it's not as rife and ingrained in Spartan culture uh, as we like to think additionally contrary to you know the idea of child exposure within Sparta something that was ritualistic or practiced very much was this idea of healthy um, birth practices in the sense that women in, in Sparta, which you know later we'll cover an episode talking about women in Sparta and the roles, but they would women would wait or the Sparta would have women wait until they're you know eighteen to twenty years old before they're even married, and then they would have children. So they're not adolescent children having children where the ch uh, chances of deformities or um, any sort of issues prob like problematic issues within the child are higher and greater. Whenever you have women that are waiting until they're 18, 20 years old, etc., in the prime of their lives, and then they're also working out, eating healthier, you know, just being healthier overall, now we start to see that there, for, you know, good hundreds of years, you know, from the archaic period to um, uh, the end of the 5th century, really going into the beginning of the 4th century, the birth rates in Sparta was actually a... a um, a higher percentage chance or rather at a higher percentage chance of the child making it to adulthood because these children were being born healthier from healthier families and additionally you know as um, adam as you talked about in one of your previous episodes how because of the lifestyle of sparta the spartans tended to be even taller than the average greek they had a lot more muscle and stuff not just because of the i mean not because they're working out but because they're eating healthier they're you know they're being born at later times when their parents are physically fit to actually have children. So there we go, Spartan uh, child killing, I guess we could talk, call it that, baby killing. Um, seems that it wasn't a particularly common practice in Sparta and certainly no different to the rest of the Greeks. And as Benny sort of said, perhaps actually less common than the rest of the Greeks as um, less Spartan children were had prematurely by immature parents and they were sort of nursed in a more collective state manner and bred and fed far more richly and, and wealthy, at least for the homoio of Sparta. Uh, thank you very much for watching episode 4 of Sparta Examined. I hope you enjoyed it and learnt something as well. Um, if you haven't checked out the rest of the series, I'll link it down below. And uh, keep an eye out for the for next episodes coming out. They'll be sort of decently consistent. So thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Alright, we're done. Sigh. <sighs>